Hello, um, a very warm welcome to you all for the sixth edition of Delighted Talks. I hope you all can hear me well. And um, today's topic would, today's theme that we go into is the history of good light beyond the visual spectrum. And if you are all wondering what the other five editions of Delighted Talks were, please feel free to check the Good Light Group's website and they have all the other five editions documented. And in the spirit of history of good light and beyond the visual spectrum, I'm reaching you from Berlin today and my good light um, looks like a cloudy sky outside today. And I thought I would um, share what my good light actually in terms of the visual spectrum looks like as an introduction. So I'm coming to you from Berlin. It's 3 p.m. late afternoon here. It's winter time. I have a cloudy sky outside. I'm looking at two of my screens here in my office space. I also have some electrical lighting on the top. And that's how my visual spectrum actually looks like a mix of daylight, some fluorescent and electrical lighting and some air LED light from my screens. And so you can see that I don't have so much of the near infrared or the UV, and that's how this visible spectrum pattern looks like. I get about 200 lux on my eyes and of a color temperature 5,600. So I really invite you now to maybe reflect on what your good light actually looks like right now. Whether you're starting your day or you're ending your day or like me, you're in the mid afternoon and whichever part of the world you're actually uh, joining in this session, maybe have a moment to see what actually your good light looks like. Um, and while you do that, um, I would like to also take the opportunity uh, to actually thank the four partner organizations that make the Delighted Talks possible. The Good Light Group, the Daylight Academy, the Society for Light Treatment and Biological Rhythms, and the Luger Research. So the program for today looks like this. So we have the welcome and introduction, uh, which I'm uh, doing. I'll be also your moderator for the day. And my name is Priji Balakrishnan. We have two fantastic talks lined up. One is by Professor Timo Patonen, who's from the field of medicine and psychiatry. And he'll be giving us a talk about the full daylight spectrum from a historical perspective. We have a second talk by Dr. Anne Behrens, and she's from the field of chemistry and uh, material sciences. And she'll be giving us a talk about beyond the visible, the proven effects of near infrared light on health and well-being. And a bit of housekeeping for the day. So what we will do is after the two talks, we will go into a panel discussion and that's where we will pick up your Q&A. So feel free to uh, leave your comments or ask questions while the talks are going on and while the discussion is going on. And I'll pick this up in the panel uh, sessions. And you're free to also comment to each other's questions and you're also free to rate the question so that I can take it in a priority order as well. Okay, so once again, um, a very warm welcome. And my name is Priji Balakrishnan. Uh, a bit of introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher and I'm currently based at the Technical University of Berlin. I have a background in architecture and I specialized and practiced in the field of sustainable designs for our built environment. And it's during my PhD that I, I actually went into a deep dive of daylighting and being able to predict daylighting in buildings. One of the works that I was uh, looking at is how do you measure and model light through trees? And for the past two years, my research has really looked at how can we not just simulate the quantity of lights within or daylight within the building, but how can you also predict the spectral characteristics of daylight and really looking at how can we provide this location specific information so that designers have this tool to be able to predict the spectra of daylight. Um, I'm also an active member of the Daylight Academy and the International Commission on Illumination. So when we were actually presented with this topic, um, it gave me an opportunity to sort of say, what was actually a light exposure through the ages? And when I thought about it, I came up with three maybe most significant factors that probably influenced our light spectrum and specifically the spectral uh, pattern of this light exposure through ages. The design of buildings, specifically the windows, our work culture, 
So the way the office work that we do and technological advancement, and in this context, specifically electrical lighting. And just to give you an introduction, and it's a very, very brief introduction uh, of this here, what our light exposure might have looked like through the ages. And if you take the cases of buildings and windows, you can see that in the prehistoric times, we probably started with just punched holes in the walls. So we didn't have a glass uh, for the windows. We really had uh, just small windows and probably security and safety were the most significant factor. So it wasn't even these holes were meant for some amount of daylight, but not really for daylight and working inside uh, with daylight. Predominantly the work was outside. We were working outside and our light exposure would have been daylight and fire. And when carpentry and the tools became more sophisticated, we probably had like wooden shutters to start to close these kind of punctures in the holes for some safety and security. And around Renaissance, glass was always there, but of course it was a very, very expensive material. And you can see glass being used. This is Villa Rotunda that was built in Italy in the 16th century. And this was a quite a famous uh, Renaissance uh, house that was there. And you can see the usage of glass being, or glass panes coming to these, uh, uh, to these windows and architectural features, but only for the wealthy houses at that time. And really uh, through the ages, you can also see that our windows got bigger. Uh, when we, we had bay windows with the Victorian houses in the 19th century and with the industrial revolution, uh, manufacturing glasses and being able to mass produce it would have really helped us have bigger windows. So predominantly during this time, if you think about it, our light exposure would have been daylight. We were working outside for most part of the time, significantly daylight. And then during the night, some form of light, either candlelight or kerosene lamps. And only, it's only towards actually the 19th century that we had um, electrical light uh, come into our domain. And you can see that from the mid to the late 19th century, when the commercialization of light bulbs came into being, that was actually the first also very significant and key factor where our length of working day increased. Um, and you can see that all through the 19th, 20th and 21st century, which we are in now, um, our environments have been dictated with the capability of us being able to light spaces with electrical lighting. And you can see this New York Times office in the 1940s, this General Motors office, um, the 1950s to the 70s, cubicles being invented in the 1960s. And even my office space when I was based in Singapore in the 2017, and now my office space in 2023. So all this while predominantly a light exposure has been, and I would say it's, it has been more dominantly electrical lighting than actually daylighting. And even if you look at the 21st century, we have uh, come a long way also to have tempered glass for our facades and we can have really full glazing for our facades, but we also end up with problems where sometimes there's too much light for the kind of work that we do in front of screens and shades come down in terms of cubicles. So all these really do impact the kind of spectral light exposure that we get on the eyes. And if you look at, it's not just about the electrical lighting, it's also if you look at the development of electrical lighting through time, uh, the kind of electrical lighting that you are under also impacts what kind of spectral light exposure you have. So we have the tungsten filament bulbs that came in early 1900s and incandescent lights, light exposure looks like that. So very low in the blue region and quite high in the red region, also going beyond the visible spectrum over here. And fluorescent lights, they, they were there even in the past, but they sort of take over these incandescent lights during the 90s. 1950s, there's an oil crisis happening somewhere in between, and really for energy efficiency, CFLs come into the market, and 1980s, even now in some of our homes, we do have fluorescent lighting, and that's how the visual spectra of uh, fluorescent light looks like. So not so much of a continuous spectra, but you do have a lot of dips and peaks in some of uh, some of the blue, the green, and the red region, and this is uh, a white uh, fluorescent light. 
And we had a big breakthrough if you look at the LEDs when the first uh, blue LED and then very uh, soon following with the white LEDs were invented in the 1990s. So not so long ago, just 20 years ago. And it became the most popular use for uh, around 2000 when it was introduced uh, for the residential use. So always residential architecture is a, is a way for us to be able to see what where the technology gets commercialized and how it enters the market as well. So really we've been dictated by these kind of uh, spectras of ele electrical lighting. And just to give you an example, I thought it would be a fun idea to look at what my visible sp uh, spectrum, uh, spectrum pattern in a day looks like in the 21st century. So this is in Berlin in winter in 2023. And you can see when I start my day, I have a mix of daylight because, and white LED. I don't have so much light at home uh, to start my day at 8 a.m. because it's winter. And then that's about two hours of exposure. And when I decide or sit next to a window or try to go outside, that's when I get a full spectrum uh, solar or full spectrum daylight exposure. And that's about 20 minutes in my day. I come to the office, I start working, and I have a mix of this daylight and the uh, LED light uh, from my screen. And that's maybe two hours. And if I decide to take a walk during my lunch uh, and the walk has a lot of trees, then that's the pattern of uh, daylight spectrum that it looks like. Very soon, there is not so much light um, exactly in a sort of situation that I'm uh, uh, presenting to you today is that I have a lot of light from my fluorescent electrical lighting in office and the screen LED. And by the time I walk home, um, I have a mixture of all these three different kinds of light, the high pressure sodium lamps that are the street lighting, incandescent lightings that are sometimes there in the corridors of residential spaces. And then when, when I go home, I have an LED that's a bit of a warm color and that's about four hours of exposure. And so if you look at it, even me who's so aware of uh, lighting in my space, I have about 25 minutes of a full uh, spectrum daylight exposure. And every other part of my day is very much dictated with where I am, what kind of electrical lighting I do have in my space and what kind of windows I have in my space. And I just want to end with this last slide where I thought it would be very good because, um, so I said my in the beginning of the slide that my good light actually looks like this. Um, it's very much uh, contained to the visible spectrum. I have almost nothing in the near infrared or the UV. But if I could actually change my desk and if I would be facing the window while I present to you guys, I would instantly get double the amount of light. I would get a huge peak in the near infrared light, still not so much UV. And if I were to decide and be so bold enough that I step outside and did this presentation completely outside the four rooms of my office, then I would have a full spectrum daylight, even though my light quantity doesn't increase, but I have the full uh, spectrum of that daylight. So that's really, um, and I think this is really gives you an overview of how different uh, visual spectrum uh, has been through the ages and maybe looks like as well. And I think it's a great segue to also uh, go on to our next, uh, the first talk that we have for today. And um, so we have uh, Dr. Uh, we have Professor Timo Patonen. Uh, who's from the Finnish Institute of Health and Welfare. And he'll be giving us a talk about full daylight spectrum from a historical perspective. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Timo. Uh, Timo is MD and a full-time research professor at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. He also lectures as associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Helsinki, Finland. Timo graduated from medicine and specialized in psychiatry. He defended his doctoral thesis in 1996 on light therapy for seasonal affective disorder. From then, his research interests have expanded and includes the effects of UV and infrared radiations on circadian clocks through the skin, the interactions of brown adipose tissue and mood regulation, the molecular basis of chronotype, and the positive and negative factors influencing circadian rhythm regulations and sleep-wake cycle. Not only that, Timo actively collaborates with lighting professionals, artists, and professionals in the field of medicine, psychology, biology, meteorology, nutrition, and sports science. I am really excited for your uh, talk, Timo, and the online platform is all yours. 
Thank you. Thank you very much and thanks for the invitation. So I will start my presentation with the contents of my presentation looks like this. So first tribute to two late scientists, then some basic facts, and then uh, this kind of a structure uh, for ultraviolet light, uh, radiation, light and infrared radiation each. So first experiments, further experiments, mechanistic explanations, our contribution from my team and current guidelines. So first tribute to goes to this scientist who said that we can scarcely avoid the conclusion that light consists in the transverse undulations of the same medium, which is the cause of electric and magnetic phenomena. And he was uh, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, who died uh, in Cambridge, uh, but was buried in Parton in Scotland. And he's tributed because of, uh, for the theory of electromagnetic radiation that covers ele electricity, magnetism, and uh, light. And of the solar radiation, daylight, the wavelengths of about 290 to 2,000 and 500 nanometers, that's the portion that reaches Earth's surface. And of that, there's 4% ultraviolet radiation, mostly of UVA, 43% uh, uh, visible light, and 53% of infrared radiation. And of these wavelengths, artificially, we use uh, most for treatment. So wavelengths of 290 uh, to 1,100 nanometers are used for uh, treatment uh, of various range of diseases nowadays. If we look at these wavelengths uh, deeper, uh, we see that uh, how they can penetrate into the skin. So ultraviolet radiation usually that is uh, used for treatment of skin diseases uh, goes down to depth of 0.1 millimeter or so. But the visible light and of course infrared radiation goes deeper into the skin, even below, under the skin. So down into fat layer, subcutaneous fat layer. The second tribute goes to this scientist who <clears throat> wrote that I was, of course, interested to know what benefit the sun really gave. I considered from the physiological point of view, but got no answer. What this useful effect really was, I couldn't find. I have been working for this goal ever since, but have not been able to find exactly what I have been seeking, though we have gone somewhat forward. And he was uh, Niels Finsen, who was awarded Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1903 uh, in recognition of his contribution to the treatment of diseases, especially lupus vulgaris, uh, skin tuberculosis, with concentrated light radiation, whereby he has opened a new avenue for medical science. And the, his awarded experiments were like this. So for the treatment of skin tuberculosis, um, sunlight is concentrated by means of glass lenses of appropriate composition into a beam from which the heat rays have been as far as possible eliminated. You see the picture here on the left side. Uh, this beam is projected on a small area of affected skin, which has been drained of blood by pressure. Uh, this uh, picture here shows the pressure. I think that was essential for the effect of, of this treatment. The beam of light is applied continuously for two hours with sunlight, and later it was one hour with the carbon arc lamp he invented. And, and from 
1895 to 1903, a total of 1,100 patients were treated by his method. And how did this method work? Uh, Danish <coughs> scientists have studied this case further. Uh, first, of course, in 1896, Finsen had himself stated that what he called chemical light, so chemical wavelengths in a way, and identified those as blue, violet, and ultraviolet uh, were responsible for killing bacteria, tuberculosis bacteria. So the Danish scientist currently uh, studied his uh, equipment, measured uh, radiation that could be transmitted through his lens systems and absorb, uh, absorption of, of the stain solution filters he used in the, in the carbon arc lamps. And all these te tested lenses of glass and filters absorbed wavelengths of below 340 nanometers. And this methylene blue solution, which was which he used to absorb heat, they blocked out the wavelengths of also below 340, as well as 550 to 700 nanometers. So uh, then they, these Danish scientists analyzed um, that there has to be, there had to be some intracellular um, porphyrins present in, in with, together with the bacteria. So radiation of these porphyrins, which are photosensitizers with rays of sunlight, may have led the production of singlet oxygen and killed the bacteria as they did in, in these Danish experiments currently in vitro uh, in six minutes. So they concluded that this is the most plausible explanation why Finsen's method worked. Uh, so in fact, wavelengths of ultraviolet A1 to green light contributed to the efficacy of, of Finsen's method. So in principle, Finsen was uh, right, but he, I, I think, and he thought that it might be mostly because of ultraviolet radiation, especially ultraviolet B radiation that would be effective. So let's go to the, now this spectrum through and start with ultraviolet radiation. First experiments, <clears throat> um, well, in the 19th century, and there was this uh, a move to a location with a pleasant climate that was a common practice for wealthy Europeans, even without any medical condition or condition that was in need of medical attention. So this sanatorium or health spa movement proper provided isolation, complete bed rest to only mild physical activity daily, meals, as well as clean and fresh air with time in the sun and can be called as climatotherapy. Uh, of interest, there's a medical documentation on climatotherapy uh, where a winter depressed patient was sent from Finland's Lapland to Germany after the two polar winters he suffered plus treated with ultraviolet rays uh, after the second polar winter. And get, uh, well, there was no benefit of that, uh, but there was a, re a spontaneous remis remission by October 1944. You can read this from this 1946 uh, article uh, more in detail. And another attempt to treat winter depression with ultraviolet radiation was made later in Harvard Medical School at the turn of the 1970s, 1980s. And again, the response was similar, that there was no benefit. So maybe ultraviolet radiation is not a treatment for winter depression. Well, uh, to continue with the first experiments, although sanatoria were designed to be sunlit, facilities for sunbathing were not normally provided. So the first open air sanatorium for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis was run in Silesia region uh, in, uh, starting in 1854 and ending in 1904. 
Since this establishment, there were many more till the 1950s. And uh, the systematic use of sunlight as medical therapy, we can call it heliotherapy, was started in Leeds in Switzerland in 1903. And uh, the protocol was as follows. So after one to two weeks of open air acclimatization, heliotherapy began on the solaria and balconies where exposure to the sun at temperatures of more than 18 degrees centigrade, so-called hot air bath, should be avoided. Uh, and it was said that a very current mistake consists in thinking that the sun bath is all the more efficacious if prolonged or taken when the sun is at its hottest. And the protocol or regime was like this. So heliotherapy began in the summer months at 5 uh, to 9 a.m. The earlier, the lower the altitude was. And it was seized before the heat of the midday sun when the blinds were drawn. And then it goes from the first day uh, till the 15th day, uh, uh, gradually uh, increasing the exposure to the sunlight. It was to treat tuberculosis of the joints, not pulmonary tuberculosis, because there was the danger of hemoptosis, bleeding and reactivation of disease and a spread of infection. And the advice was the sun should be dispensed, so to speak, drop by drop when nearing the region of the thorax. And with this kind of a regime from uh, 1903 to 1913, uh, Auguste Rollier uh, uh, treated um, patients uh, with the success rate of 75% in restoring joints to normality. But these experiments came to an end by two reasons. So there was a sunlight used for treatment of rickets, rachitis in children or osteomalacia in adults from 1890s to the 1930s. But after the invention of how to produce vitamin D, which is in fact pro-hormone, uh, uh, these first experiments were over. So vitamin D could be added to food by ultraviolet irradiation, fortification or supplementation. And sunlight was also used from the 1900 to the 1950s for granulating and infective wounds open to tuberculous cavities, tuberculosis of the bones and joints, and close tuberculosis foci of the glands. But these experiments came to their end because of the invention of antibiotics plus vaccination against tuberculosis. So exposure to sunlight and the use of heliotherapy were responses to two big health issues at one time. Our contribution regarding ultraviolet radiation is that we have studied whether it can produce mood enhancing effects and whether it affects uh, the circadian clock in the skin as well as in the subcutaneous fat. We have used narrowband ultraviolet B uh, and ultraviolet A1 as well as placebo for this ultraviolet A1 exposure. Current guidelines for ultraviolet radiation, uh, it's called phototherapy for some reason. Uh, you can use broadband ultraviolet B radiation, narrowband ultraviolet B radiation, and ultraviolet A1 radiation. For some reason, this ultraviolet A2 radiation, these wavelengths are not used in for treatment. Indications nowadays cover psoriasis vulgaris and many other skin in diseases. Then light. First and non-avoided experiments by Niels Finsen again. 
for treatment of smallpox, the chemical rays, he said, ultra, meaning ultraviolet rays, are filtered off by means of red glass and red curtains, etc., thus preventing their irritative effect on the affected skin. And the reason was that now treatment could be and given, administered, without having to keep the patient in total darkness, but in the red light, like in the dark room, for days. But this was <clears throat> um, confronted by, by scientists, and Finsen wrote, it has been difficult, of course, to get the method generally accepted or even tried. It was too marvelous and it gave rise to skepticism I can hardly believe that skepticism in regard to this method is so great that the idea of a careful scientific investigation would be flatly refused at a moment when the therapeutic importance of light as a means of treating lupus and other diseases of the skin must be said to be generally admitted everywhere. He wrote this in 1903. Half a year later, he was awarded Nobel Prize. Experiments then revisited, as I call them, uh, uh, along these ideas of earlier experiments. So there's dark therapy, then for darkness from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. for rapidly cycling bipolar disorder, first um, uh, given, reported by Thomas A. Ware. Uh, then there was this uh, invention of what, to, what if using blue lighting blocking lenses from 8 p.m. to bedtime for bipolar disorder, uh, and etc. But the real cutting edge experiments for using light uh, in treatment was that it was found to be effective for depressive episodes. So exposure to white, about full spectrum light, 2000 lux for a depressive episode of bipolar disorder, first reported by Alfred Louis. Then there was uh, this report by Daniel Kripke, uh, 1000 to 2000 lux for depressive episodes. Um, and then followed by 2500 lux for seasonal affective disorder reported first uh, author was Norman Rosenthal. And since 1985, many others tried these uh, treatment uh, guidelines in Switzerland, the Netherlands, UK, Norway, Sweden, Finland, etc. And then uh, exposure to dawn simulation up to 1000 lux for seasonal affective disorder was described in report by Michael Terman and his co-workers. All these <clears throat> used light treatment, so-called, let's say, bright light treatment or dawn simulation treatment. Bright light treatment uh, regards refers to 2,500 lux. It could be about similar that you uh, read out the measure here uh, from the lux meter put here on the grass at 5 to 10 a.m. That's the difference. So the timing of the light exposure is critical here, I think. In the retina, <clears throat> there are five kinds of photoreceptors. There are three kinds of cones. Then there are rods. And then there are these intrinsically photoreceptor retinal ganglion cells as well. And they produce integrated signals leaving the retina to the brain. And timing of light therapy, light treatment with visible light usually is timed for in, in treatment of winter depression from 9 to 10 a.m. So it's the time when you can achieve phase advances of the circadian rhythms most clearly. But nowadays, usually we are exposed to artificial light throughout the day from the morning to the evening, and there's no variation in intensity of light exposure. 
uh, it may lead to circadian misalignment, maybe even circadian disruption. And if this condition continues for weeks, for years, it can end in uh, cardiovascular diseases, low-grade inflammation, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity, some mental health disorders uh, like depressive disorders, and maybe some skin diseases as well. So electrical lighting and the constructed environment as compared with natural exposure to sunlight uh, leads to a situation when there, where, where there's reduced exposure to the sunlight, of course, but also increased light exposure after sunset, marked here with yellow, and this results in slowing down the circadian clock and uh, face delays of the circadian rhythms and uh, maybe underlying this kind of a circadian misalignment or even circadian disruption. Our contribution with light treatment, we have studied since the early 1990s, circadian rhythms in seasonal active disorder, sleep structure in those patients as well. Also, can we use exposure to morning bright light in the blind and to have some uh, mood enhancing effects then for use, uh, for preventive use of uh, light treatment for winter type of seasonal affective disorder. Then we have studied physical exercise alone or combined with bright light uh, on mood. And then also light treatment in healthy people and made a community-based trial with dawn simulators as well. Current guidelines regarding light treatment with uh, visible radiation, their indications are seasonal affective disorder, also the milder form called subsyndromal seasonal affective disorder, and then these circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders. And lastly, the infrared radiation of the spectrum first experiments uh, starts from 1960s, uh, 1966 to 1985, more than 1,000 patients were treated with low energy laser radiation by Mester's method here on the left hand side, a ruby or helium neon laser was used for this laser beam therapy. Uh, then 2001, near infrared light therapy with uh, NASA LED for wound healing, and since then experiments for other conditions. So LEDs can be used for this kind of a treatment as well, like here on the top. And then there was a new invention using whole body hypothermia that was induced by water, inf water filtered infrared A radiation and used for treatment of major depressive disorder. Uh, 2013 was the first publication of this indication. It's experimental treatment at the moment. And the idea of infrared radiation has been that it stimulates the cytochrome C oxidase in the mitochondria. So it uh, necessitates the local administration of infrared radiation above the uh, region you want to treat. Uh, of interest, there's a links between uh, a metabolic network in our body with, uh, to circadian network in our body. So they, they have a crosstalk with each other. And the absorption peaks of cytochrome C oxidase are indicated here. Uh, there are three peaks, um, slices of the spectrum. One of those is in the infrared radiation wavelengths. Our contribution to the infrared radiation studies has been that we have used this water filtered infrared A radiation administered on the buttocks and lower back from, from part body radiators. 
So we test the hypothesis whether the effect is mediated uh, by the influence on the circadian clock in the skin or whether it could be mediated by shutting down the uh, brown adipose tissue. It might be that in the depressed persons, uh, brown fat is overactive. And by administering infrared uh, radiation, you can shut down this overactive brown fat activity. We have studied uh, with uh, this, uh, our, our mm, uh, uh, interventions by uh, taking punch biopsies down to the six millimeters. So we have skin and subcutaneous fat samples, and we have made molecular genetics analysis, omics analysis, which genes are upregulated, which genes are downregulated before, after. So what the effect influence of, of these interventions with ultraviolet B as well as with infrared uh, radiation are uh, on the circadian clock in the skin. Current guidelines for infrared radiation, it's nowadays called also photobiomodulation with low level laser or LED light therapy. It covers these wavelengths, so there's also visible light, orange light, red light usually, and then of course infrared A radiation. And indications seems to be local indications so far, pain in knee, osteoarthritis and shoulder tendinopathies, muscle injury and foot ulcer, especially in type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And the acknowledgement goes to my co-workers at my institute, uh, at University of Helsinki, at Aalto University, at Tampere University, at Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority of Finland, at University of Eastern Finland, at Karolinska Institute, and at Medical University of Vienna. Thanks for attention. Thank you, Timo. That was a very, very insightful presentation. I can also confirm that I hardly get 2,500 lux, <laughs> even if I'm outside in the winters when it's cloudy in Berlin. So um, we look forward to more questions. Uh, so if you are joining in or you already saw Timo's presentation, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A Zoom box. And I will take this up in the panel discussion later. And I would like to invite Anne Behrens to join us for this uh, session for the second talk. Uh, hi, Anne. Hello. And um, Anne is going to be uh, talking to us about Beyond the Visible, the proven effects of uh, near infrared light on health and well being. Uh, it's my pleasure to also introduce uh, Dr. Anne Behrens. Anne Behrens is Program Director, Life Science at Seaboro. And during her PhD research in the field of chemistry, she investigated synthesis methods and fundamental properties of light emitting nanoparticles. After her PhD, she joined Seaboro initially to develop new light emitting materials for LEDs. And while she's still working on light and lighting, her research interest has shifted from material sciences to the biological effects and related applications of light currently focusing on the near infrared spectral window. And together with her scientific partners, she investigates the effects and mechanisms of near infrared light on our bodies, thereby also translating these insights into technology that enables both energy and cost-effective health benefits in consumer products. Um, so Anne, the online platform is all yours. Thank you for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, all right, as uh, Priti already mentioned in her introduction, I'm uh, working for a company uh, called Cibero, based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. 
And in my talk today, I will talk about uh, the effects of near infrared light on our health and well being. As probably most of you won't know Cibero, as we are a very small company, I have two slides as a short introduction. Um, as mentioned, we are based in Amsterdam at the Science Park, where we have our labs and where we investigate and develop a meaningful light innovations um, that should contribute to a more sustainable world. We do this in three different R&D programs. Uh, our electronics program developed an electronic solution to um, develop a truly universal retrofit LED tubes to replace the uh, fluorescent tubes that contain toxic mercury and that are um, also not super energy efficient. Our materials program develops a new uh, phosphor material, a narrow band red emitting material that enables another 15% of energy uh, savings for warm white LEDs. And the life sciences program that I'm heading, uh, where we investigate how light affects human health and well-being and develop technologies that improve human health and well-being uh, using light. The technology that we developed in the life sciences program uh, we call SunLED because we were inspired by the most important source of natural light, the sun. And if we look at the solar spectrum, and this is uh, already uh, mentioned by Timo in, his, in the previous talk, uh, a large part of the solar spectrum contains uh, consists of near-infrared light. Near-infrared light is invisible, but it is very healthy for people. It induces a biological effect called photobiomodulation. Near-infrared light is absent in the indoor environment because it's uh, not part of, uh, of uh, LED light, <clears throat> as you see. Sorry, as you see here in uh, the white spectrum. Um, and what less people know is that near infrared light is also blocked by windows, especially in um, modern uh, buildings where uh, we use high end glazing to improve the insulation of buildings. Uh, the window glazing is covered with all kinds of coatings. And this is uh, shown, for example, in uh, these spectra uh, that I took from a brochure of a uh, architectural uh, window glazing company. And you see here the transmission spectrum of all, all the different coatings that this company uh, can, imply, can apply to the window glazing. And these coatings are very nicely transparent in the visible part of the spectrum, but you see that uh, basically everything that is beyond the visible is blocked. And this means that even when you're sitting next to a window, uh, the near infrared light exposure is uh, too low to benefit from uh, photobiomodulation effects. With our technology SunLED, uh, we envision to bring the health benefits of near infrared light into the built environment so that people get healthier and happier while they're spending their days indoors. And that is important because in Western societies, people spend about 90% of their waking hours indoors and I guess uh, about 100% of their non-waking hours. Uh, so it's important that the indoor environment where we spend so much time is good for our health and well-being. And not only do we spend a lot of time indoors, uh, we also spend a lot of time in front of screens. Um, I guess everyone now is sitting in front of the screen. Uh, and that's on average seven hours per day. So that's 40% of our waking hours. And with our technology, we can um, make screen time healthy. And we do that by improving the physical health, the mental health and the immune system of people. If we look how photobiomodulation is uh, used today, uh, that is uh, mostly in therapeutic devices. Uh, I've put some examples here on the slide, and these devices are all based on the principle that tissue should be directly irradiated with red or near infrared light to induce the positive effects. In other words, these are all focused on local treatments, or if you want a full body uh, effect, you end up with these huge panels or even beds where you have to uh, lay in for uh, several uh, minutes to half an hour undressed and um, you're fixed in that position for that time. Uh, you see here also uh, that uh, the health benefits of near infrared light are widely recognized. So there's uh, regularity, regulatory approval by the FDA and other organizations uh, for uh, treatment, uh, all kinds of treatments. Uh, and there's a lot of literature available for a wide variety of positive effects. 
However, our vision is slightly different than these therapeutic devices. We think as people have evolved for thousands of years outdoors in natural sunlight, that also healthy people will benefit from regular near infrared light exposure. And we envision to bring this near infrared light uh, back into our lives as we spend uh, our days indoors uh, in the most cost and energy efficient way. Some words on the, on the mechanism of uh, the health benefits of near infrared light or photobiomodulation. Uh, photobiomodulation is a non-thermal effect. So people that are exposed to near infrared light don't heat up. It's not a sauna. Um, instead, red or near infrared light activates the, our mitochondria, which are the main uh, sources of ATP, the body's energy source. The most hypothesized mechanism of photobiomodulation is that the, the red and near infrared light activates cytochrome C oxidase, and um, in that way, um, more ATP production is induced. And, and next to ATP production, there's also other molecules um, produced as a side effect, um, like uh, ROS and nit nitric oxide. And also these molecules have their own a variety of downstream positive effects. However, we know that near infrared light can penetrate very deep into the skin. And also Timo showed a very nice figure to illustrate this. And that's uh, formed the basis of our, our hypothesis of systemic photobiomodulation, meaning that near infrared light um, can penetrate so deep into the skin that it can activate cells that are close to our blood vessels and that all these extra produced molecules are then transported through the whole body through our uh, blood system. And in that way, the full body can benefit. Now, this hypothesis, of course, had to be tested, and also we had to see what is uh, well, an effective dose of near-infrared light to um, uh, achieve significant health benefits for healthy people. Um, and we asked uh, two independent research organizations in the Netherlands to do a clinical study to test our sunlight technology, Groningen at work, uh, together with the University of Groningen. So they performed a clinical study that met all the scientific criteria. It was double blind, randomized, placebo controlled. And it is tested different doses of near infrared light in different seasons, summer and winter, on generally healthy people like you and me. And in total, there were 60 participants uh, participating and they were using this special desk lamp that you see here in the, in the slide for in total four weeks, five days a week, three hours a day. Um, and then we looked at the short term, so the direct effects of near infrared light exposure and also the long term effects. And we looked at both objective and subjective parameters. Um, <clears throat> in view of time, I will only briefly go over the, the main results uh, in detail, um, starting with well being. And I refer to uh, the publication of this study that you see the, the link in the lower left of the slide. Uh, so for those of you that are interested, please uh, please read it. It's not behind the paywall, so accessible for everyone. Um, so let's start with uh, the well-being data. Um, during the data analysis, parameters were grouped in categories to gain statistical power uh, to, um, to obtain a composite score. So what we are looking here now at is the composite score for well-being. And then when a composite score was shown to be significant, the underlying parameters were analyzed individually. Um, and for the well-being composite score, we grouped the subjective parameters together. So this figure shows in blue the data collected in winter and in orange the data collected in summer. You see a significant improvement of the well-being for subjects that received a 6.5 joule per square centimeter dose um, in the winter. And uh, also season was shown to be significant, which means that all participants scored better on well-being in the summer compared to the winter, independent of the near infrared light usage. The two most important factors contributing to the well-being score are mood and drowsiness. Uh, drowsiness uh, here in panel C and mood in panel D. And you see that um, uh, these parameters both show a significant improvement for the highest condition in winter, so the 6.5 joule per square centimeter dose. Uh, and uh, in both, for both parameters, we see a generally better performance independent of near infrared light in summer compared to winter. Other parameters that contributed to the well being score are sleepiness, need for recovery, and subjective performance, uh, but these do not show significant effects of uh, the photobiomodulation treatment or season. 
Uh, nice to note here that for the factor mood, the positive effect of the highest dose was already measured uh, and significant on the short term. So uh, this provides a very nice uh, convincing consistency, consistency in the data. And um, uh, drowsiness was not measured on the short term, so that's uh, unfortunate. Then uh, here we look at the composite score for health. Um, this uh, composite score is built up from uh, objective parameters, and we see here a large improvement for health for the 6.5 joules per centimeter group in winter, compared to a small decrease in health for the placebo group. Um, and in summer, there is no uh, significant difference between the groups. Then we look at uh, the different parameters that are building up this uh, health composite score. And in B and C, there is two different inflammatory cytokines uh, shown. Um, these, uh, uh, you see here a significant reduction of the systemic con concentration of interferon gamma concentrations for participants in the highest condition um, in winter. Initially, there was no significant effect observed for the uh, TNF alpha concentration uh, shown in C. However, uh, when the factor BMI was taken into the model, this led to the observation of a significant reduction of TNF-alpha in the highest condition compared to placebo in both seasons. Um, there was also a significant interaction effect between BMI and the highest dose, um, which means that the higher BMI prohibits to some extent a decrease in TNF-alpha. Um, and this effect could be explained by the different metabolism of fat cells in obese people. Uh, Timo also uh, just briefly mentioned this. Um, these uh, the fat cells in obese people produce five to tenfold increased TNF alpha mRNA compared to lean fat cells. Um, so that's um, uh, a counterweight, to put it like that. Um, another factor contributing to the composite score health is the resting heart rate. Uh, this was uh, significantly reduced over time in the highest condition compared to placebo in the winter. Uh, and the significant reduction was already observed on the short term, which again makes this a very consistent effect. And, um, and lastly, there was no significant effect of dose or season observed in the uh, level of cortisol just prior to, to sleep. Um, to summarize, uh, and I realize that I go I'm going over this uh, at quite high speed, um, we see three main effects of uh, near-infrared light exposure on healthy people. Uh, we see a positive effect on physical health, which we uh, analyzed by looking at resting heart rate. Resting heart rate is an important indicator for physical health. Um, I uh, 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 did some uh, literature study and uh, there's this very nice meta-analysis that shows that if your resting heart rate is 10 beats per minute higher, uh, you have a 15% higher risk for cardiovascular disease and a 14% higher risk for cancer. So that is uh, a really strong correlation. And we see that on average, after four weeks exposure to sunlight, uh, people have a five beats per minute decreased resting heart rate. So that is a really um, significant improvement of their physical health. Uh, and I always also compare this to what you have to do in physical exercise to uh, realize a similar decrease in resting heart rate, rate which uh, corresponds to um, three times per week, uh, 45 minutes bicycling for 12 weeks in total. So that's quite an investment. And um, our technology has the nice advantage that you don't have to do anything special for that. Then on the mental health, um, we saw a significant improvement of uh, the mood of people that were exposed to near-infrared light, and they also feel less drowsy during the day. And the immune system, uh, I discussed uh, the inflammatory cytokines, where we see a strong uh, reduction of the circulating concentrations of these uh, inflammatory cytokines, which uh, uh, corresponds to a lower risk of uh, all kinds of autoimmune diseases. So what do we learn from these results and what does that mean for application of near-infrared light in the built environment? So we know, based on our study, that if you irradiate only part of the body, in our case, the face and neck and uh, perhaps the part of the hands of the people, we uh, measure full body uh, benefits. And here again, you see a picture of the lamp that was used in our clinical study. Uh, the squared module attached to the pole of the desk lamp irradiated the near infrared light, so that was directed at the face, neck, and 
under arms of the participants. And this is enough uh, for full body benefits. So photobiomodulation is really a systemic effect, at least in the conditions that were tested in our study. This means that we can use narrow beam angles to direct the light to the place where it is effective, the skin of people. And this is a very big contrast to what we uh, normally do for white light that is used to illuminate the full floor area and even the walls. Uh, narrow beam angles mean that we, all the light is directed to um, the face and neck of people in uh, the picture that I'm showing here. This means that this solution is energy efficient. There's no waste of light. Every photon can be absorbed. The easiest use case is this a uh, situation where a user is in a very well-defined place and um, not moving a lot, for example, in front of a screen. Another important uh, learning from the, uh, the study that we did is that uh, we know what is an effective dose and we know that the threshold irradiance of five milliwatt per square centimeter uh, that we tested is enough to induce this photobiomodulation effect. It is important to know that there is a threshold irradiance. It is not very well uh, mapped out what this threshold irradiance is for the different wavelengths and the different effects that you might be uh, looking at. Uh, but what we know uh, is that what we tested in our clinical study is enough, which is five milliwatt per square centimeter at 850 nanometers. If you would do this and deliver this five milliwatt per square centimeter in continuous operation, that would be very energy intensive. It is uh, almost 20 times as high as what we normally use for 500 lux visible light. So that would mean uh, super high power drivers and a lot of LEDs and uh, very expensive solutions. But this is not needed because with short bursts of light pulsing, uh, this energy requirement can be spread out over time. And this is uh, well depicted in the figure here. In short bursts of time, you overcome the irradiance threshold while the average energy draw is um, relatively low. And this means um, that you can um, uh, well use less LEDs, use uh, less uh, complex drivers, and the whole technical solution becomes much more simpler and cost effective. And it's also possible to spread out this uh, total light uh, uh, or this, yeah, the, the light dose over a longer time. Because if you think about yourself in an office environment or living your day-to-day -day life, uh, many people spend more than three hours at their desk during a work day. Um, so an effective dose can be delivered in, for example, three hours in a desk situation. And when you think about situations where people are sitting in a very fixed position for longer times, um, the possibilities of uh, integration, our sunlight technology are really endless. You can think of car interiors, you can use uh, a laptop or another screen uh, or display system. You can think of a smartphone or uh, a, a plane situation, uh, desk lamps, freestanding luminaires or uh, different kinds of luminaires or PC accessories, so which means it's not integrated, but still in the office setting. And uh, just to illustrate um, how this can be done, I will discuss in a little bit more detail a reference design for uh, a laptop or monitor or PC accessory use case. Um, so you can get an idea of uh, the complexity or the simplicity of uh, integrating near infrared light in our day-to-day -day lives. So as a reference design, um, uh, I choose to use a, a USB accessory type. And you see here a nice sketch and how that could look like in your own office environment. Um, the target surface area of this device is the face and neck of a person sitting behind a monitor. The target action distance is 75 centimeters. So um, this is a, a reasonable distance for a monitor. And the target dosing time is three hours. Now to check uh, whether these uh, uh, reference uh, use case parameters made sense. We did a small uh, experiment in our own offices and you see here some uh, data uh, of me working behind a uh, monitor, a PC monitor. Uh, in the left picture, you see uh, over a workday, the average distance of my head from the monitor and uh, the dotted green line shows the use case of 75 centimeters. And the mean distance of uh, myself behind this monitor is uh, around 68 centimeters. So uh, very nicely closer than the 75, which means that uh, within three hours I will receive uh, or I would receive my, the right dose. 
And on the right side, you see the uh, X and Y displacements. So uh, how much I, I'm moving in lateral dimensions or up and down behind my monitor. Um, and the green circle shows uh, the illuminated area if you would use a beam angle of the near infrared light of 28 degrees. And you see that using um, well, a 28 or 30 degree beam angle that really nicely covers uh, the, the space where a person would move when uh, working behind a monitor. If you then simulate uh, the performance of this USB accessory using three high power 850 nanometer LEDs with this uh, well, lenses to create a 28 degree beam angle, um, we drive these LEDs um, in a pulse mode with a 3.1 amp peak current at 100 hertz and a 10% duty factor. Again, the dis average distance 75 centimeters, the peak irradiance averaged over the total phase area is then, uh, or the, the total area um, uh, covered by the 28 degree, 28 degree beam is 5.9 milliwatt per square centimeter, so well above the threshold. Um, a person here would receive a dose of 6.4 joules per square centimeter in three hours. So that is um, uh, perfect, ma perfectly matching what we studied in the clinical study. If you then calculate how much power is needed to for this solution uh, using a forward voltage of 10.9 volts and assuming an 85% driver efficiency, the time average power draw is four watts, which is uh, well below the 4.5 watts uh, of USB 3.0. So it's very well possible to design a USB powered uh, product that delivers a proven effective near infrared dose um, in three hours. And that can be very easily integrated in every workstation. So we think this is a very neat example. And to show that for laptops, it's even uh, more ideal, I would say, uh, this is, again, data from myself working behind a laptop. And you see that um, the working distance is less than 50 centimeters from the screen. So that means that uh, you get a uh, effective dose in much less than three hours, or you could use even less LEDs and save battery power of your laptop. So this is a um, very nice result and encouraging to look into integrating our technology in, uh, in devices. And this is also what we are doing uh, here in our offices. We are, make, we are building proof of concept devices. And you see here that our technology can very easily be integrated in luminaires, a desk lamp, or this uh, very um, modern freestanding luminaires, um, or even in a laptop. And um, we hope that um, there are some uh, commercial parties willing to work together with us to build these, uh, build actual products that can be sold into the market because uh, Cibro. Uh, won't do that. We won't do that ourselves. We are really an R&D company and hope to work together with other parties to bring our technology to the market. Um, to summarize, uh, I have shown you that um, well, healthy invisible near infrared light is absent in the indoor environment. And that is a shame because uh, an independent clinical study showed that near infrared light improves health and well-being of generally healthy people. Uh, and I've shown you that integrating near infrared light in the built environment is feasible. We can use pulsing to overcome the irradiance threshold. We can use narrow beam angles to avoid losses and make use of the systemic effect. Uh, and I've shown you a reference design of a 4 watt USB power device for a working distance of 70, 75 centimeters that is very well capable of delivering a proven effective dose uh, in a very feasible manner. And to end, uh, a shout out to my colleagues at Cibero uh, and uh, all the people from uh, Groningen at Work, University of Groningen and University at Buffalo that helped in uh, the, or that are main, re main responsible for the clinical study that we did. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne, for the great presentation and such an insightful presentation also to know how beneficial near infrared light, light is for us uh, on a day-to-day -day effect. Um, if I can also invite uh, Timo to join our online session. So we'll go into the Q&A. Um, I already see Timo has answered a lot of questions, so nice. So I'll take the questions that's not been answered. And then if we have time, maybe go through the questions that you answered. Maybe it's useful for the whole uh, audience as well. 
Um, I actually have a question for Connie, which was for me, and uh, that was about whether glazing actually, or what is the influence of light coming in through the glazing? And I think, Anne, you had a very good slide to actually show how uh, light, uh, how the light is cut off in near the near infrared parts uh, when there are different glazing effects. And the one that I showed in my presentation, we have a double glazing over here and it's a neutral color, so I don't have any tints. But as long as uh, when you have a sort of tint or a, a effect that is uh, made for this glazing, then there is going to be some significant uh, cut in the, even in the near infrared UV, of course, I think all window producers now cut off the UV. Uh, so, so I guess that's answered. And then I have another question from Steven Oik who asks, is there a recipe for the optimal indoor light spectrum dynamics or CCT dynamics during the day for optimal health? Maybe both of you can actually, is there a, is there an optimal indoor light exposure in terms of spectra that we can recommend? Uh, well, if I can start, um, uh, I, uh, <coughs> the in intensity of light exposure is, is that that I, I know about. So more light in the morning hours. So let's say bright light exposure during the morning hours, then afternoon, uh, uh, the light intensity can be lower. So that kind of a standard lighting intensity. And uh, the more close the evening comes, then you can dim down the intensity of light. And at night, it should be dark. But as far as I know, of course, you can modulate the light exposure by <clears throat> color temperature or the spectrum uh, wavelengths you have in uh, emitted from the light source but uh, as far as I know it doesn't play a great major part of course the most alerting wavelengths are those of, of the blue sections of the visible light okay so in fact quantity matters more than the spectral at least in terms of health and well-being yeah uh, for in the clear light. contrasts in Contrast. the intensity because circadian clock follows those cues. Right. Um, and I have a question from, uh, I don't have a name for this person, but um, the question is, um, an IR is, uh, so non-infrared uh, radiation is helpful in recovering opsin, example for preventing snow blindness, or did I get that wrong? So that's a question, whether near infrared helps uh, in preventing snow blindness. Is this something? I don't, I don't know, actually. Okay. Um, the, the effects of near-infrared light on eye health are uh, on our radar to uh, to start investigating, but it's not yet um, part of my research. So most of, uh, if I can actually ask, so most of what you do in terms of near-infrared research, it is through the skin. So it needs to be, the exposure needs to be through the skin and not through the eyes of the... So so far, all the the studies done in the mechanism of uh, photobiomodulation are skin focused. Indeed, um, there are studies that also show that there is an effect on eye health. For example, uh, dry eye or other age related uh, uh, eye conditions. Uh, and yeah, I I just don't know what snow blindness exactly is, so I, I don't dare to comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, so far the mechanism is thought to be primarily via the skin. Right. Okay. And I have a question from uh, Margarita as well for you, Anne. Uh, do the positive effects of uh, NIR get delivered by the conventional tungsten lamps, or is it only possible for daylight? We, of course, saw that sunlight can do this, but are there other lamps in the market that can do this, or is it just that if we don't have sunlight, we need to go outside? Um, yes. Yeah, so. The, this threshold is really the, the key thing here, because if you look at uh, uh, incandescent lamps, uh, and we, we did the comparison, if you would use incandescent lamps to uh, illuminate an office to 500 lux illumination levels, which is a well, uh, well-known standard, uh, then the uh, radiance in the 800 to 900 nanometer spectral window is 0.15 milliwatt per square centimeter. So that is 
really too low to induce an effect. And even if you would integrate over a much larger part of the near infrared and infrared spectral region, the intense, the irradiance levels are too low to overcome this threshold. So um, it is unlikely that you get health effects or at least significant health effects of incandescent lights. Is Sunlit the only lamp in the market currently that is doing such a work or that can provide such intensities um, for these beneficial effects of NIR? Uh, well, we are unfortunately not yet in the market, but ah, okay. uh, there are therapeutic devices that can get to these higher irradiance levels and to the right dose, but you should be careful because there's also many that don't. So uh, um, some would be nice if the, the manufacturers of the, or those brands would advertise with the radiance specification and those levels because very often they're off. Right. Okay. Um, ah, yeah. So that was the next question by Steven Noyek is, is there an NIR LED package or other end products available on the market? So we already answered that. Uh, and Connie has another question, which is referring to the therapeutic devices. How can we promote full body effect for preventional goals? And maybe this is, um, I'm not very clear about the question. So maybe these are therapeutic uh, lamps that you mentioned that is available in the market. Yes, indeed. What is available on the market are therapeutic devices, and, and that is how we differ from well those propositions. We hope that in the end, um, people like you and me that are uh, not exposed to uh, to sunlight a lot, because we are either living in Northern Europe or we are uh, bound by uh, by desk work, uh, that can still uh, benefit from near infrared light without having to s sit in front of a uh, large red panel half an hour every morning, but just well, living our normal lives. Yeah, so I also noticed in your presentation, you mentioned that the face and neck was enough, in fact, to get the whole full body benefits. Yeah, great. Um, oh, there's another question uh, for Anne as well. It's because Timo answered all his questions on the tab. That's great. Okay, so for Anne, what is the recommended dose of uh, NIR? Short bursts of three hours. Okay, so, so this person, Robert, he already got the answer, but maybe we can okay. take the question. So he asked whether the recommended dose of NIR, what was the recommended dose of NIR? Whether short bursts of three hours gives this value or doesn't give this value? Yes, so what we uh, saw in the clinical study is that a dose of six and a half joule per square centimeter over the face, neck and hands, uh, so that multiplied by the projected surface area results in four kilojoules, um, that that is enough to uh, realize significant health benefits. And yes, you can achieve that by the short bursts, bursts over three hours. It uh, depends on, uh, uh, on the frequency and the pulse width that you choose. You can also spread it over eight hours or a one hour, depending on the use case uh, that, uh, that you could do. Right. I also have another question from Alejandro who asks, does skin color affect how sunlight works? Um, well, uh, melanin, the pigment in, the, in our skin, does not absorb uh, 850 nanometers. So um, uh, that uh, should not be the case, no. Okay. And I probably can also ask this to Timo if the studies that you did had any effects um, based on geographical locations. And of course, the skin color, when you, you also spoke about near infrared light um, and it's you expose it through the skin and if skin has skin color has any effect. Um, no, skin color has no effect. Okay. Vitamin D, I, I think vitamin D, yes, because unanimously yeah. when I came to this part of the uh, part of the world, everybody told me I had to be on vitamin D and that was the case because my skin color or darker skin color can't absorb uh, as much vitamin D as uh, more fairer skin or whiter skin. Yeah, it, it concerns the ultraviolet B radiation wavelengths then. Right. Okay. So no effect on the near or the infrared exposure. Uh, and I have another question from Boden, who asks, how fast do you think the near infrared light will be integrated into indoor products and will replace or enhance the existing products? 
Uh, I, I hope soon. Uh, so this is uh, what I'm uh, working on every day to convince uh, the, the bigger lighting brands or whatever brand that wants to make positive impact on the, on the health and well-being of people to, to start using our technology and products. Usual product development cycle takes at least nine months. So um, uh, if you're very fast next year, but um, yeah. Usually, is there an adoption time in the market? So, you know, we had LEDs for the past 20 years, but I'm still sitting under a fluorescent light here. So there definitely seems to be an adoption. Uh, how, uh, the adoption is not so quick as the uh, probably the market or the product is available in the market. Do you have an estimate of how quick uh, the adoption is or... I think that will really depend on the, the brands that will be uh, the first entering the market. You can imagine that if Apple would be the la our launching customer, it would be much faster than um, uh, an unknown uh, Chinese uh, lamp manufacturer. So, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. I think Apple Watch for kids now have a light exposure on their watch, uh, which is tracking their light exposure, which is great. <laughs> um, okay, so... I have another question, which is, is there a limit of light intensity where above the limit might cause a detrimental effect, especially for visible or infrared? Let me then start commenting on the near infrared and then yep. you, know, you can comment on the, the visible part. Um, so for uh, photobiomodulation, it's known that there is a biphasic dose response. Uh, curve. So at some point you reach an optimum, and after the optimum, the, it goes down again. Uh, and it's, if you go very far, it might be detrimental. Uh, our technology uh, is really focused on the lower end of the dose response curve. So uh, very much below what you would receive in a dose when you would be outside for a whole day on a sunny day. So from that perspective, uh, that's safe. Um, yeah. Yes, and concerning visible light, then, uh, well, outdoors there's no limit, of course, because it's very bright there in in, in sunlight, and uh, of course the the direction of your gaze is not towards the sun but elsewhere, and there's a contrast changes all the time when you walk around outdoors, but if you take a bright light treatment inside using artificial uh, light devices, then um, intensities above 10,000 lux usually start to produce some kind of a irritation. So it, it's uh, not so comfortable anymore to sit under or in front of these light devices. So it's something between 2,500 2, and 10,000 luxes that are used for light therapy. Can I also ask, because when you presented, you said that 2000, according to your research, about 2,500 lux is probably required for SAD and seasonal affective disorders. And this 2,500 lux is only the visible spectrum, I presume. It's not the yes. UV or the near infrared yes. light. And is there a good duration? Because you also mentioned that about 5 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m. was it that it was the best to receive this amount of light. But what was what is the ideal duration in terms of hours uh, in that case? Yes, uh, to start with uh, half an hour regularly every morning or at least five mornings a week. Um, then some need more, so up to one hour each morning. Uh, and usually it's something like that, but not more than two hours per morning are needed. Right. So we are, in fact, very dependent on electrical lighting because for there's no way in the winter we do get actually 2,500 lux outside. Um, okay, so I have another question. What is the advantage of sun LED uh, compared to PBM devices in the market? Um, so in the end, the biological effect, uh, PBM photobiomodulation is the same. Uh, we we focus on a different use case and where um, current devices are really therapeutic devices um, that uh, that are used for special treatments that are usually quite uh, high cost um, because they are delivering all the light that you need in a very short time. You need a lot of LEDs, a complex driving uh, driver system. That's very different from 
the how we envision bringing near infrared light back into our lives and by integrating it in devices that we are already using. So um, I think we'll make it a lot easier to to get a healthy dose. Uh, yeah, I think that's the the main difference. Right. Um. A lot of people have asked whether this PowerPoints would be shared. So the slides won't be shared, but all this session is recorded and it will be available online along with all the other editions of the Delighted Talk. So they will be available on the Good Light Group's website. So you can access it uh, over there for future reference as well. Um, I have a question from Ko, uh, Kony, who asks both me and Timo whether we do need some uh, we do need some research on school hours and circadian rhythms of school buildings and light exposure. Is there any progress in this area? Maybe Timo, you can go. Um... So uh, light exposure at schools for school children and all all the professionals working at schools. Yes, of course, those are very complex interventions to carry out. They, they have been done earlier, but I think that the, the results are not very convincing so far. So there's a really a need for further study with rigorous methods. And I'm, I'm of course, in favor of those kind of interventions to be done. To be able to define what is an optimal light exposure yes. for children in school, yeah. And from the architecture perspective, of course, we do a lot of studies in this field to be able to say what good classroom design should look like. I have also a PhD student who is now looking at how light exposures uh, affect also myopia and these cases. And this is, of course, an ongoing, I think, field of study where we don't have maybe well-defined metrics. And it's all often public institutions like schools and change is sometimes uh, not so easy to um, be made in such kind of uh, uh, institutions as well. So it's it's in research, I guess, and we do need more research and it's something that is quite important too, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Jivoni. Uh, is there evidence of different effects of NIR when administered at night? Uh, thinking about an evolutionary scenario where NIR was only present during hours of sunlight. Uh, yes, so that is uh, uh, indeed an interesting thought. Uh, I know that there's papers uh, um, showing positive effects of NIR during the night. I also am aware of a paper that shows uh, effects on melatonin uh, levels. Uh, when near infrared light is applied. Interestingly enough, that was not observed in the clinical study that was done with our technology. So that's uh, an open question. Um, I, frankly, I don't know. And, and when I don't know, I indeed tend to use the rule of thumb. Well, when is the sun shining during the day? So, so let's focus on daytimes when administering, uh, or yeah. Right. Then, yeah. Thank you. I have a quick, maybe if we can answer it in one minute, uh, we have two minutes to go to end the session for now. Uh, one is, uh, can sunscreens or other type of sun lotions actually block an IR? And I'll end the Q&A with that last question um, over there. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, most sunscreen is, uh, is more focused on blocking UV. I haven't looked in the, the chemical chemical composition enough to know whether it blocks NIR too. It's an interesting question. I will, uh, I will look it up. Yeah. Nice. Thank you so much for both your presentation, uh, Timo and Anne. Thank you for the audiences also for coming and participating. Like I said, these sessions will be available online. Now, Delighted Talks was part of a one-week uh, Daylight Awareness uh, Week uh, that is organized by the Daylight Academy as well. We had a good presentation on Monday. This was a second session. There is an upcoming, which is tomorrow. There is a great documentary, uh, which you can catch, which is called Solar Energy, The Test of Time and Politics. I think there is a chat box where uh, Daylight Academy has produced a link. Uh, you can click that link and also sign up. Uh, so I hope you enjoy also the rest of the Daylight Awareness Week. You, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and this webinar. Until next year, maybe. Yeah. Thank you so much and bye-bye. Thank you to all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.